I'm Pamela Fagan Hutchins, your host, and this is the show where I talk with other crime fiction writers about the stories of thrills and suspense that will leave you mystified, sometimes horrified, and always wanting more. Please join me in welcoming today's special guest. Well, hello out there, everybody. Uh, welcome to Crime and Wine, formerly known as Wine, Women, and Writing. I am Pamela. I'm coming to you from snowy Wyoming, where it is going to be minus 17 wind chill tonight. So I hope you're you're cozy and have a good book and a bottle of wine. I have a recommendation for your good book tonight. And that is da -da -da -da, What They Saw by M.M. Chenard, who's my guest tonight. Hello. Hello. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Today's book release day for you. Yes. Yes. Very exciting. Very busy day. And I always feel like I'm going to forget to thank somebody for all of the people that are being so kind and awesome about my new release. Well, I, I got to start out by telling people that, you know, if you don't guys don't remember this, I read the books for the people that were coming on the show every single time. And there are occasionally some where I have to go oh, your book was so interesting, or oh, <laughs> you wrote a book. But I do not feel this way about what they saw. It's really a great crime fiction thriller. And so far, you know, into a series, how do you keep it going? How do you keep the excitement up with Joe and Bob and the crew? Well, okay, so this is one of the things that um, I really love, actually, about writing a series, is that I started out at the beginning with this idea of who she was and what her wound was and, you know, the, the, the things that she was facing. And when I started out, um, the first book that I wrote, I didn't know that it was going to be a series, but you always hope, right? You always have hope. Right. Um, so I, I wanted to set up a journey that I was going to enjoy writing over... Yeah you know, as many books as I would be lucky enough to hopefully write. Um, and I wanted to build in areas for growth. So I don't want to give anything away, but um, so this is book six. I just finished the second draft and sent it off to my editor of book seven. And I'm going to start book eight. And I know that book eight is going to end with a change to Joe's life that is going to give her a whole new set of challenges. So what I try to do is like every three books, I try to give her something new that she's ah. facing that kind of builds on. Cause I, I feel like that's what, what, what life is, right? Like you, you go to college or, you know, whatever training it is that you do for your job, you build up your career, then you face, you know, possibly getting a partner, possibly having kids. There's all these new sort of hurdles and relationships that you have to navigate. Um, and we're not the same people that we were at 20 that we are at, at 50, if only because we're not facing the same things, you know? So yeah. um, that, that's, I'm, I wanted to be able to shift that. I absolutely love that. And when, I, when I'm thinking about the progression in a series, I, I literally think about it like I do writing an individual book, you know, that you divide it into acts, if you will, and that you need at least three books in the series to have an arc of character development before you can kick off the next arc of character development. And yes. I have a series that's languishing at seven and, and it's killing me. I want to get back to it because it's like, but all I have done is introduce the need for growth, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I, yes. I, I saw here in number six that we're dealing with some commitment issues <laughs> with Joe. <laughs> yeah, that's kind of been, um, you know, that's that's her her biggest, I think, wound or the, the thing that she's been trying to grow from is that she's had two men in her life that she loved and both of them died tragically and she was there for their deaths. She witnessed it. And so yeah. she somehow feels that she should have saved it. Um, saved them or that somehow it's her fault, of course, and that if she yeah. would have been just better at X. Um, in the first case, she was a teenager. There wasn't really anything she could do, although, you know, it, it's always hard to tell yourself that. But um, she she wasn't able to testify in court against the um, the perpetrators. So she still feels guilty about that. So anyway, the point is, is having gone through these things, um, she doesn't trust herself with people she loves. She thinks yeah. that the people that she loves are going to die on her watch, basically. Um, and she's been going through a whole lot of therapy and a whole lot of um, trust issues to to get to a place where she can finally have a partner that maybe might have a future together with her. 
It will take a lot of patience, but he will, we hope. We'll, our fingers are crossed. Because <laughs> he sounds kind of dreamy. He's like, I'm not going to give anything away, but he's a super nice guy. <laughs> he is super nice. Um, but as with all people, not perfect. And so far, I've written him perfect, but I know a couple ways he's not perfect. So. Oh, yay, yay. Yeah. So you're going to torture us in the future. I love <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, so with with uh, the next book you have finished, I was going to ask how many you're working on at once. Next book is is queued up in and ready to go. Joe lives on to fight crime another day and so yes. screw up relationships or whatever it is she's going to do. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Yeah. My current contract is through book eight. So there will be after the one that released today, there will be at least two more. So, That's yeah. News. Very good news for everybody out there. Um, I've been throwing up a couple of Facebook comments as we go. If you have, if you're watching this live and you have questions for Michelle, um, I feel free to um, pop it in the comments. I am watching them, and uh, I don't know if you can see them when I do this. Um, can you I, see? It says, "I love Joe and Bob." This is from Bella. Cook. Yes, that that. <laughs> came up right now but I, I don't see them kind of as they're happening so they scroll on my side so it's kind of mm. sneaky but um <laughs> grabby hands somebody wanting number seven and number eight yay <laughs> so um the 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 excitement for your show and the response from the people that follow my page has been really high so I'm hoping today is just super super successful do you still celebrate each new release I celebrate, but I'm kind of, um, I'm, I'm sort of geeky about how I celebrate. I do silly things. So like last night I made and decorated some cookies and, and that's, I don't have the, the big events. And I think part of the reason for that is because like most of my releases have been during the pandemic when really we couldn't. So I'm yeah. still sort of learning like how to do things and, and how to engage. So that's one of the reasons why I'm really glad to be here today because it gives me a chance to do something fun. Yeah, it, it you you know Zoom has been the great um, bridger of gaps uh, with uh, you know the video streaming and stuff with the pandemic and and it seems to have stuck in a way that helps us introverted authors you know reach out a little bit but still yes. wear our pajama pants from the waist down. <laughs> Writing Raise bridges, your... I call them. Yeah, <laughs> Wait, yeah. Raise your hand if you're wearing pajama pants. Hmm, I don't see. <laughs> Might be yoga pants right now. <laughs> I was on a Zoom the other day and I started to stand up before I realized I had on flannel PJs. And then I was like, nope, I'm going to stay seated. Nope. <laughs> um, so with, um, with respect to the characters in your book, who do you identify with most of the characters that you write? Or are they all just from your fertile imagination? Mm, I mean, I think there's little pieces of me in everybody. Um, and then there are things about everybody that are very much not like me. Mm -hmm. So um, like if, if my, if my sense of humor, if I'm just being, you know, my natural sense of humor, that's most like Lopez and my addiction to caffeine would be like, <laughs> Lopez. Um, the, my academic self who I used to be as an academic is kind of like Marzilla when she's in her zone and she's doing, you know, her thing. Um, I love her. Thank you. Um, <laughs> Joe is kind of, um, apart from the aforementioned wound, but like, you know, her other stuff is kind of who I would like to be in terms of self-awareness, willingness to grow, her compassion for others, the connection that she has with, you know, the ability to see other people, even really horrible people to be yeah. able to sort of see into who they are and, and understand them. Um, those are things that I wish I was. So She's kind of maybe like a, a mirror shadow of me. Yeah, well, and and I think I think that's that's fair to be able to really um, write good characters. You have to be able to understand them and appreciate the things that are good in them, and have a little love for each of them, even if parts of them are unlikable. So she exhibits that, and you do too with what you write. Now, with plots, are these things that just boom come into your head? Or do you scan crime, you know, blogs and, and podcasts? Or how do you come up with your um, with your plot lines? By the way, it is crime and wine. And so I do have a red here. So a little awesome. bit. Awesome. <laughs> um, so, 
each and every one of my books has sort of come to me in a different way. So the answer to your question is yes, all of those things. I'm yeah. addicted to true crime stuff, no matter what. So I don't have to go out of my way. I'll, I'll see things that kind of are in the back of my head. Like to this day, there is this piece that I read about um, feet washing up on the shores in Canada and sort of up in Washington. And, Gross. and, um, and, and that I was just like feet, really just feet. And I, I read about it and it turns out that it has to do with um, most likely people are drowning that, and the only shoes that come out that wash up are in athletic shoes. So they must, it's because they can't, they um, bounce. Why can't I speak right now? I have float. words. They float. float. Thank yeah. you. They <laughs> float and make it to the shore. Um, but so now I, I, I know at some point I am going to do a book where feet are washing up on the shore of something or it, it's just going to happen. Yeah. Um, but then yeah. other, sometimes it is, um, so like in this case, in the case of what they saw, I, like, I think two years ago when the, when the Golden State Killer was first caught, I went to a seminar about, um, well, it was about a lot of different aspects of it. They were discussing it and they were discussing um, how difficult it was to prosecute him because most of his crimes, the rapes were, uh, and that's what they had evidence for, the statute of limitations had run out on them. And, um, you know, my books are written in Massachusetts, but yeah. I live in California. So as a Californian who, who saw that, I kind of went, I'm sorry, what? And yeah. that just really made me angry in it. And I started doing some research into statutes of limitations. And that's kind of where this came up along with the question. I've always found it really, it's got to be really hard for district attorneys to make some of the decisions that they have to make about who to prosecute and who not to prosecute. And you, you might have enough to know that this person did it, but not enough to, to convince a jury. So what right. do you do in that situation? So I kind of put those two things together and that's what happened with what they saw. I, I love it. Um, as a, as a former attorney, you, you know, I, I just remember also as a woman feeling the same way about rape statute of limitations. It's such a violent crime and for it to be something that, um, you, you have no recourse for, um, after a certain period of time is not so good. We had a question and that is from Bella, um, who I love, uh, Michelle, are you going to do another standalone book? I would love to do another standalone book. Um, I, I'm sure I will. It just, the question is just um, when. So, <laughs> and, 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 you know, it obviously depends on what my publisher wants as well. So, but I would love it. Yes, for sure. Yeah, how many are you writing a year right now? That's Pamela wanting to know. <laughs> oh, geez. Okay. So, right. This is a weird year, um, but it's going to ultimately be three that I've written in, in yeah. this. It's, it's a little hard to judge because, you know, you're, you, you write actively as well. So, you know, that you're sort of editing one while you're writing another, while you're doing the proofs for a third kind of thing. Mm -hmm. So it's, I, I can't be exact, but it's, this is a busy year because we are trying book number eight is going to have uh, a Christmas theme. So, oh, so you, you've got a clock ticking on you. <laughs> we got a clock because I got to be able to get it done and it has to be good enough and ready, of course, to be able to be published in October of next year so that we have it right on time for the Christmas season. So this year has been a little intense. Yeah, sometimes having a, <laughs> thank you, Bella. Um, sometimes having a clock on your creativity can be inspirational and sometimes it can just be terrifying. And my mother who does watch this show just commented that I'm not a former attorney. I'm still an attorney and she is correct. Yes, um, <laughs> good mom, you tell her. Mom, mom. <laughs> um, it's time for the speed round. And, um, uh -oh. and so Michelle is going to be asked approximately 10 questions. Okay. I'm the one with a piece of paper in my hands, maybe uh -oh. eight, maybe 10. I may just keep going all day. And, <laughs> um, and I'm going to randomly pick them as we go. So um, let's see. It's happy hour. What are you ordering? Uh, anything with caffeine. A large amounts of caffeine, the more the better. That's what makes it happy for me. Even at bedtime. That's impressive. <laughs> it's also, true. It's do you write at night? I do. Yeah. Okay. I'm usually up until like two, three in the morning. So that, that makes sense then. Painful sense. Um, uh, sushi or pizza? Yeah. Two courses, obviously both. 
<laughs> Very good. Um, favorite place you've traveled to or lived in? Paris. Why? Uh, it's beautiful. It's romantic. It has all the art. It has so I'm I am um, part of my lineage is French. So I've, you know, being able to go and see things that like I've seen churches where relatives have been baptized and uh -huh. all of it. I mean, there's there's nothing wrong with Paris, in my opinion. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. Um, and let's see. Yeah, silliest thing you keep in your office. Do you keep an office? This is my <laughs> office. And this is the silliest thing. See, I was ready for this one. Um, this this is a little, it's a Halloween thing. It doesn't matter. But I bought it because to me, it is the ghost of Ernest Hemingway. And he keeps me writing when I don't necessarily want to. Oh, so, he scares you. And, and by the way, I will, I'll channel a little Ernest Hemingway. I'm on a first draft. So you, um, what is it? You, uh, you write drunk and edit sober. So <laughs> I write 3,000 words tonight. Someone really likes your comment on pizza and sushi. And um, and so let's go for another here. Um, what's your favorite part of writing? First draft, rewrite, or research? Mm. So that's, that's tough because I like all of those things. Um, and for different reasons, the thrill of the first draft, when something happens that you're not expecting, and it's just like this big, awesome burst of adrenaline. Um, I love revising because there's a part of me that hates it when things are out of place. So being mm -hmm. able to get, and those things that happened that I didn't expect, being able to go back and put them in and line things up is just very satisfying and right. I love learning new things so I can get lost in research forever you just gave me a tiny bit of appreciation for first drafts um I I enjoyed that too so thank you because I would have said I hated him a minute ago um what's your writing outfit um my writing outfit is usually a graphic tee with something sassy and crime fiction or crime true crime related on it um I, my favorite is one that says you inspire the inner serial killer in me um and then <laughs> yoga pants yeah i just laughed way too loud into the microphone i should have turned my no, head you did. <laughs> um <laughs> i'm barking tonight okay and um let's see i didn't put this one on your prep list but do you uh -oh. have playlists or theme songs for the books you're writing? So I did a playlist for um, the Dancing Girls, which is the first in the series. Mm -hmm. um, and if you know the book and you go through the, the, the playlist after you see all like all of the spoilers are there in the songs. So it's oh. kind of like hidden Easter eggs for people that actually know and, and love the book. Um, I haven't done that for any of the other ones, but I do have certain songs like um, there are some times when I write um, scenes, like especially in book two, I wrote um, some scenes out in Cajun country um, and I love Zydeco music. So I would put on, you know, the Beausoleil to channel um, yeah. to channel that for Joe. And uh, so I tend to set moods for myself with music. And it, it's hard for me, though, to listen to, to music that has words when I write. I'm not sure why. Um, dog or cat? Both. I have both. And I feel I reject the dog cat dichotomy. You're not split personality then? I, no. <laughs> <laughs> I have a dog. I have, well, about to have four, four dogs and, um, and one cat that is uh, around here somewhere. And I got it. I do. I love the cat. I got to admit. Um, <laughs> so are you a plotzer or a pantser? You know, I've, I've started out very much a pantser and as time has gone by, I've become more and more and more of a plotter. Um, and actually one of the, the coolest things that say, I've always been, um, when I'm stuck, I will do free writes and I will just write down all kinds of crazy ideas and follow it through and say yes to myself, no matter what I put on the page. And then usually something will distill out of that. Um, and I recently saw uh, the Duffer Brothers Masterclass and they out, they showed their approach for outlining and it was very similar. And I watched it and I, and, and I kind of followed along with them and I outlined book seven for the first time, completely start to finish. And so I'm going to keep trying that and see if that keeps working for me. Do you do it from start to finish or do you take breaks to free ride or you just kind of, how do you, how do you make yourself sit, sit down and actually finish it as a answer. What I used to do, I used to just do it when I was stuck on something, when I wasn't sure, you know, what was happening. I, and there was a problem I needed to fix. I was a plot, had a plot hole, you know, whatever mm -hmm. I would do that. Um, but with this thing, with the Duffer brothers, they have steps that they kind of go through. And I, so I just sat down and did it along with them. And then 
sure yeah. enough, when I was done, I had an outline and I was like, okay, well, let's write and see, because this is the first time having a full outline when I started. And I wasn't sure if I was going to feel like hedged in or, but mm -hmm. it, it worked really well. So, um, I'm and impressed. I'm quite sure that my editor will appreciate having more structure. <laughs> <laughs> I know it's like sometimes it's like structure structure is what you get after your editor tells you to rewrite the whole thing and why <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> right just finished uh, uh structural edit um yeah yesterday I couldn't find my way I'm starting um second book in my um new series and I just sat down and started free writing because I was staring at that outline and so I'm really intrigued how could I have kept myself in the outline but um, I'm going back to it now that I gave myself permission to do 3000 words and find my way. So um, let's do one last one. Um, there's so many good choices. Um, I like this one. First five things you spend your lottery winnings on are house on the beach, house on the uh, beach. flat in Paris, which will not surprise you. Um, yeah. And then the other three would be paying off my loved ones, whatever's basically. Aww. Yeah, cool. So, so you, you uh, are a beach girl. That would have been another question. Beach or mountains? Yes. Beach. <laughs> another hard choice. I feel like I would want to be able to alternate because I, but I do love, I have a special affinity for water actually of all sorts. It can be uh, lakes. It can be the ocean. It can be rivers. It can be waterfalls. I just love water. What we've learned about you tonight is you can't choose between pizza and sushi. You can't choose between plotting and fancy. You can't choose between dog and cats. And you can't choose between beaches and mountains. I'm not going to say anything else. <laughs> I don't like how this is turning out for me. <laughs> but we love your books. And we're glad you chose to write about Joe. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you for having me. This has been a wonderful way to spend my publication day. Yay. And I, I just, um, I hope you are um, getting a uh, great gratification out of pressing that refresh button and looking to see how um, the book does, because I'm sure it's going to be a big hit for you. And I'm going to bid goodbye to Michelle M.M. Chenard, what they saw. Thank you, everybody, for watching. Yay. In the um, Joe Fournier series. And I'll see, we'll talk to you soon, I hope. Thank you so much again. <laughs> and you guys. I am obligated at this point to let you know that for my upcoming shows, you can actually see them on my website so that you can, um, when it's not release day, pre-read the books or at least go back and revisit the series and other books by that author to prep for being really invested in the interview. And while you're there, you can check out my new releases, Bighorn and Sitting Dunk or um, any of them. I don't care. I'm not picky. Read all, read all you want. Crime and Wine is copyrighted and solely owned by Authors on the Air Global Radio Network. All hail Pam Stack, from whom all blessings flow. We have one or two last comments. Susan, Susan um, Ward-Roberts says, thank you. And Suzanne says, really enjoyed it. Eric says, great show. And Bella, we love Joe. We do. That's the perfect way to end, right? We love Joe. I will see you guys next time. And I really appreciate you being here. Thanks for joining us today on Crime and Wine, chats with crime fiction authors and Pamela Fagan Hutchins. We hope you enjoyed this episode and we'll check back in with us next time. For more thrills, suspense, and stories that will mystify, sometimes horrify, and always leave you wanting more.